mistiest part of the trail where record keeping fails. Odd hits are found in my big country town, stinkers amongst the odd holy grail. Tricky week this week, kids. The charts from 1961 are far from complete, so there'll be a fair bit of guesstimation about arrival and departure dates. Still, these are the voyages of the week ending 6th of October, 1961. Number 10, a good one to kick us off with Don Gibson's great sea of heartbreak. This was his first pop crossover hit, he only had two, but he managed 82 top 40 entries in the US country charts. He was covered most notably by Johnny Cash and Neil Young with Oh Lonesome Me, which was his other pop hit, and Ray Charles had a smash with I Can't Stop Loving You. Don Gibson passed away in 1975 and was deservedly elected to the Country Music Hall of Fame in 2001. Number nine is Donald Where's Your Trousers by hit-making phenomenon Andy Stewart, who had a slew of hits in 1961, four on the top 40 at the same time at one point. While to modern ears this may sound like inconsequential fluff, bear in mind that my hometown was a major immigration point for Scottish migrants and they had a profound influence on local cultures. So records like this would sell because they celebrated the Scottish experience. And the part of it where it turns into a manic rock and roll song is always worth a listen and a chuckle. In at number eight we have a decidedly odd record. More Money For You and Me by The Four Preps. The Four Preps were a bog-standard four-part vocal group who made comedy records which impersonated a lot of other better vocal groups whom they wanted to see off to various exotic locales courtesy of President Kennedy's new Peace Corps, thus ensuring a larger domestic market share for themselves. The further it goes, the more mean-spirited it gets. It debuted at eight but was off the charts in about a month after that. Number seven, oh dear. Number seven is Dave Bridge's Shadow-esque version of the kids' song Skip to Malou. Bridge was the guitarist in Cold Joy's band, The Joy Boys, whom we will meet later. What's the record like? It's a hyperactive version of a nursery rhyme and the Wiggles did it better. From the ridiculous to the sublime, at number six, it's Patsy Cline with, in my opinion, one of the very greatest records ever made, I Fall to Pieces. Turned down by both Brenda Lee and Roy Drusky, who was worried that he'd sound effeminate, Cline swooped on producer Owen Bradley and asked could she record it. When the session was set up, the Jordan heirs of Elvis Presley fame, Patsy called Elvis Big Hoss, were booked to sing and Klein was worried she'd be fighting them for the space on the record, so they were a brunt of a dose of Klein's famously blunt speaking. But worse still, Klein's nemesis Hank Garland had been booked to play guitar. Now, Klein's favourite guitarist was Grady Martin, a genuine good old boy and a great guitar player, and she loathed the arrogant and condescending Garland. Back to Elvis, Elvis hated him so much that he refused to attend sessions Garland played on, coming in late at night to do his vocals after Garland had left. Garland had the habit of simply turning up to sessions, sitting in the lead guitarist chair, and when challenged, she'd just say something like, oh, didn't you get the call? And the producer would have to turn the guitarist that he'd booked away. Such was Garland's clout. One time, he actually tried this on one of Klein's sessions, Displacing Grady Martin and Klein went to town on him, chasing him out of Decca's famous Quonset Hut studio. Bob Dylan recorded Blonde on Blonde at Columbia A next door and out into the music road, cussing his name and threatening to kick his ass if he ever tried that trick again. Presumably she'd calmed down by now. The other big problem was the A-list musicians Owen Bradley hired to play couldn't play anything but the standard country shuffle, which was exactly what Bradley didn't want. So a country shuffle though it became, and Klein's impeccable phrasing and the soulful catch in her voice bent around the beat and the Jordanaires responded superbly. They and Klein became besties in the process. Klein nailed it in four takes. Legend has it that her vocal even reduced the veteran session men to tears. The upshot of all this was the record when released did diddly squat. 
Country stations said it was too pop and pop stations said it was too country. Decker started a drop promotion but one plugger, Pat Nelson, refused to give up on it and finally convinced a pop station in Cleveland, Ohio to start playing it. It took four months but the song finally hit number one on the country charts and number 12 on the pop charts where it stayed for another five months and became the legendary record that it is. It could have been an even bigger hit if Klein had not been involved in a terrible car wreck that put her in hospital for six weeks, cutting into her personal appearances. But sadly, 18 months after I Fall to Pieces peaked, Patsy was killed in a plane crash and country music lost one of its greatest ever stars. Number five. Bobby V had quite a few hits in the early 60s, 38 US top 40s with 10 in the top 10. He also provided, as I'm sure I've mentioned before, Bob Dylan with his start in music as his piano player. And Dylan never forgot this. In introducing V from the stage in 2013, singing one of his hits, and the crowd acknowledged V, who by then had Alzheimer's disease, with a round of applause. See, Bob Dylan isn't always a dick. Anyway. V had a better voice than most of his teen idol rivals, very clear but also plainly influenced by Buddy Holly. Take Good Care of My Baby was a staple on oldies radio back in the days when this town had an oldies station. In at four, it's one of the pioneers of Australian rock and roll, Johnny O'Keefe, with perhaps one of his best loved songs, I'm Counting On You. O'Keefe wasn't the greatest singer ever and he had more than his share of terrible luck including a Patsy Kleiner-like car wreck, but he made up for it with incredible determination, indomitable spirit, and knowing the right material to record. He had four number one hits and a swag of top tens, the last in 1974 before he died of a drug overdose in 1978, a drug addiction possibly brought on by the unattended consequences of the serious head injuries he suffered in that 1960 car crash. The best story though about Johnny O'Keefe is that at Sunbury in 1973, on a bill with prog and heavy rockers like Billy Thorpe and the ear-splitting Aztecs, Paul Crocodile Dundee Hogan, who was MC for the day, announced the next act up was a newcomer and to please give him a warm welcome. O'Keefe, who was at a low ebb of his career, initially was booed by the legendary drunken mob of 30,000 or so, but quickly won them over, and in the end, they wouldn't let him leave the stage. You could never count Johnny O'Keefe out. At number three, with Smoky Mokes by the Joy Boys giving Dave Bridges two appearances this week. A pointless sort of surfish instrumental, except this one is just plain annoying. Why were there so many silly records on the charts this week? Having said that, the silliness ends here at number two, with possibly the best thing Elvis Presley cut in the 1960s, Little Sister. It topped out at number two, but it was possibly because its B-side, his latest flame, a perfectly serviceable song, was also on the charts. But Little Sister is a greasy, grinding rocker with a vaguely antisocial edge given Elvis's penchant for 14-year-old girls. It ran up the charts right to the end of the year, whereupon the behemoth of Can't Help Falling In Love took over. Well, that's the facts dispensed with and the science has settled and while we can all feel a little foolish, there's one guy you can never make a monkey out of because he already is one. Hey-ho, Monty, do your thing. Number one. Well, it's come to this. The number one record is for this week and this week alone, Michael by The Highwaymen more completely known as the Made of All Work folk song, Michael Row the Boat Ashore. It also made number one in the UK for a week, and it's a fitting topper for the predominant lameness of the chart this week, bland, dull, and sanctimonious. The Highwaymen had been around for a while, although any success they may have had could be attributed to the team in their label's marketing department, who in 1959 recommended a change of name from their then current moniker, The Klansman. When asked what they should change their name to, the marketing team most likely replied, anything, for the love of God, anything, but the Klansman. Well, that's it then. Basically, this week's chart was a dung heap with a couple of diamonds on top. 
Hopefully this won't discourage you from joining us again, and if the good Lord's willing and the creeks don't rise, that'll be in a week-ish.